is um, having disease in your colony is common in the spring. There are uh, some stress disease, what we call stress diseases, spring diseases that occur in many, many colonies. And so it's only, it's a matter of finding it, but also then um, trying to assess how, how, how much it is. Is, it, is that a real issue or you have found something that is unusual? So I think all of it starts with uh, Paul uh, Longwell here is from uh, Olympia. He, he had come down and joined us. And he has purchased a set from what is called Guelph University. Uh, uh, the, uh, the technician there has developed these. Um, and the, the idea is that these would be designed to be put into a frame and you could use that as a teaching frame. Um, so I'm going to use those today in, in, as part of the, of, the, uh, of the way we'll look at it. So you could actually have a close-up look as well as with the frame. So it all starts uh, looking at what's healthy, and the easiest thing to see in a colony is cat root. And so we'll often start with it. <laughs> Mike, I've given you a full-time job here, yeah. catching the flying. You got a rock there. There you go. Um, uh, catching uh, with cat brood, the easiest thing to see. And so it often starts with what we call spotty brood pattern. And it just looks like instead of being nice and solid like we'd like to see, it is spotty. And it can be spotty where eggs are being placed. It can be spotty where larvae are being placed. So first, the thing that we might look at would be spotty brood pattern. So I have some spotty brood pattern frames here. We can pass them around. Now these are from a dead out. So we have a spotty pattern and often it's duplicated on the other side. And what has happened is, is due to, um, in this case, mites, the colony um, was losing adults faster than it should have over the winter period, starting right away in September and October. And as it got colder, the colder nights, the, the bees cluster with that cold, anything starting below 50 degrees, and then they get closer and closer in the cluster. And so what has happened in this case, they have clustered away from where they had cat brood. And so we see this sort of this pattern of the cat brood being scattered sort of around the edges. You can see this side particularly that shows up also very, very well. So that pattern around the edges because that's where they left initially to get closer and closer together as they clustered, okay? So our bees today at our temperature today will be clustered and um, they had a couple nice days and a lot of pollen has come in and so you may be losing some of this brood in some of your colonies this time of year. Now likely that's going to be where the eggs are in colonies because that's how they expand. So you think of a ball that's expanding, expanding in the frames that are the side. We get this cold spell, this cold snap compared to the last couple days and we may get that same condition. So here, here's a good example of, of um, the, uh, the spotty brood pattern. How long does it take for the eggs and the larvae to die? It's, it's a temperature time factor, and I can't give you the answer. Um, Troy was asking me, is there a good study in terms of chilled brood um, where someone's actually looked at that? And I haven't found one. Um, so it is, a, it is a function of the two, but I, don't, I, can't, I can't tell you what it is. So um, uh, this one I think is, this is the normal one I think, Paul, we're thinking. Yeah. These, these look like nice brood patterns. So this would be what we call a solid pattern. And a solid pattern does not mean that every single cell is filled, but the vast majority are. And it can be capped pattern or, or larvae pattern or egg pattern, okay? So here's another frame that is again has this very scattered. This is another dead out frame. And two weeks ago I talked about dead outs and diagnosing dead outs. So what has happened here, the same thing, the bees clustered, they went away from brood. And in this case, um, it happened pretty quickly. So what we need to look and see is, um, is this effect of mites? The female mite puts in a, uh, in, in a cell a um, a deposit of her her waste and that signifies to the young where 
the feeding hole is. So bromite make only one feeding hole in their host. That's the adult female uh, that goes into the cell after the, the larva to the pre-pupa finally becomes the pupa. And that's where her young are going to feed. And, it's, uh, and so she's, she's marking where that is. So we can actually look and we can see in the cells, and it may be in any place, but it's a, a very white, prominent, something um, pasted to the cell wall. Now, we talk about should we use frames that have disease or should we continue to use them? And that process is what we call culling of frames, culling of frames that, that have um, um, the possibility of the pathogen in the cells but also um, frames that are very dark in color, uh, frames that have a lot of drone brood. So here's an exact, ex good, very good example of a frame that could be or should be called um, because the bees are gonna have to clean this up and that's a big cleanup job. We can't get these larvae out of these cells. It's not gonna work. Um, but the other is the at least half of the frame, at least okay. half of the frame is drone cells, okay? And you can see by the size. So this would be a great example of a frame that ought to be or should be called. Now, one of the things we want to check for disease is, does the remain, do the remains come out? We can put that on that, that, that one so others can see. Do the remains come out? So here are, are things that have died over the winter. So we're gonna take a toothpick in a cell that has a puncture hole, can we get the remains out? And see how the remains came right out? Very gray in color, very gray in color, but the remains came out. That's an important characteristic, okay? So I simply put the toothpick in a cell that had a puncture and pulled it out, and you can see how gray this looks. So I'll go ahead and pass this around. You can go ahead and see the drone brood and you can look at the mite iguano that's in the cells. Maybe question. go the other way on this one. How's that? Go ahead, Steve. Uh, if the uh, mites are in those cells when the bees pass away, are they going to die in there too? Can they come out? So the mites, when the bees die, if they're, they're reproducing in those cells, they're going to die as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when the worker bees puncture the cells, if the female, the foundress female is still alive, she could come out. She could get out. She could get out, and then she's going to overwinter on a body. Okay, now that's a dead out, so she died with the dead out. But, but it, if you still have a live colony come spring, um, that can, she's done the inoculum to start that whole cycle the next active season. Yes. yes. Nathan. So with yeah. what you had uh, done here, yeah. if the remains come out, that's a good sign? So, good sign. Remains come out. What's remains a bad sign? Come out. Uh, bad sign is, uh, we're going to get to that, it, it, but they, the remains form a scale that doesn't come out. Okay. Okay. So that's the bad sign. When you talk and, about culling frames, can you just scrape off the wax and clean them? So if that's a plastic foundation, yes. Okay. Um, you have to do both sides, of course. Mm -hmm. Or you can, in some cases, pop them back out. Because uh, if you know, right. if you've assembled the plastic, there are some plastics that are all molded and you can't do anything with them. But if it's the one where you pop in that plastic sheet, sometimes you can pop the whole sheet out. And um, rather than scraping, some people will use a uh, torch. Troy, I think you say you use... A melt it with a torch? Um, not, not you, okay. I, I usually just found that if there's a whole bunch of, uh, when you scrape it off, there's a whole bunch of the larva uh, cocoon still stuck in it. I've tried pressure washing it, and it just doesn't work. I, I just throw it out and put a new one in. Okay. That's, that works the best. And, then, and you put a coat of wax on it. Okay. That's the other thing I've heard, the pressure washing rather than, uh, than the torch. I've used a plastic paint scraper. Paint, plastic paint scraper? Okay. Um, the uh, Hive and Garden sells a, a very sturdy hive tool like this. This, this wax is very <laughs> tough if you've tried to do any of this. I'm not particularly uh, promoting this, but, the, but, but your regular 
high tool, your hand is going to get tired very quickly trying to scrape that off. It is really tough. And if you're thinking of wax, well, I'm going to recover all that wax. It's remarkable how little wax you can recover from these old toes. Okay, and then you have to do a lot of cleaning up. Every time you clean it up, you lose more wax every time you go through the nylon screen. Okay. Uh, Paul, you had a, you're going to have a comment. Clean. What I use is I just use a paint, paint scraper, you know, the little three inch ones. I just take a Bunsen burner, I heat it up, and then I just go right under the comb, and it just peels right on. Okay. Heat it up, and then it peels off much yes. easier. Okay. Yep. Okay. Do you heat up the paint scraper? You heat up the paint okay. scraper so it's hot. Yeah. So it's like that. So underneath. Yeah. 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 Inevitably, you're going to bang up uh, knuckles on that, okay? So if you are some someone that uses hands a lot, computer, whatever, um, for go, just throw them out, <laughs> okay? Uh, wax moth can come in into, uh, into our colony, so if no one has ever seen wax moth, we don't often see the adult, but we can. They're in colonies over the winter. These are the tunnels that they make. Um, so people, we say, people will say, Wax moth killed my colony, all right? Because by the time you discover it, there is nothing left to the colony. It looks a little bit like, like that. This is earlier stage and then a later stage. I'll go ahead and pass this around. Uh, that's not true. Wax moth is a scavenger, so what it's doing is it's doing its job. It's scavenging a colony that can't protect against wax moths, do, uh, the caterpillar particularly, okay? We say it's an enemy of beekeepers and does cost a lot of money for people in the south. But the issue is um, in bee trees, when a bee tree dies, wax moths come in and scavenge. That means those remains are being recycled. So it's a recycler, okay? But again, it doesn't kill, but it's a symptom of, of the colony has been dead for quite a while, okay? Colonies may die over winter also from um, issues with queens. They don't need a queen over the winter, but obviously in the spring they need to. Um, when you start seeing this evidence from a colony, and what it's showing is the uh, what, what were developing queen cells that have been cut down. When colonies replace their queens late in the year, that's often a death knell too because they then can't uh, get a critical population to get through the winter. So this is sort of what you'll see in and again, body brood. Uh, on one side, you can see the cap cells are drone cells. The other side, David, that side, you can see those are drone cells because the cappings are capped, they're domed, okay? So same thing. Um, that didn't kill the colony. Something happened, the queen replacement didn't go well or happened very late in the year and they just didn't get the critical mass to get through the winter. Okay, so several different factors going on there. Uh, early in the season, we may see this. So these are the capped queen cells. And when they're on the face like this, um, and particularly there's, there's several, um, an imperfect measure, but there are several, that indicates that they have lost their queen and the bees then are attempting in this process to get back queen right. So they're doing emergency queen rearing. And this is a traumatic ex event for the colony. It's going to lose brood for um, almost a month's period of time. And depending when that happens, that could be the death knell for the colony. Even in the spring, replacing the queen, it set the colony back, and then that can be uh, the death knell for the, uh, for the colony. And uh, then sometimes you'll see a lot more of the drone cells. The insert here is the drone cells. Um, so seeing a lot of drone cells, other than on that frame I put around, other than where there are a lot of uh, built uh, drone cells, you start seeing them scattered, something that is going, going on that's not very good for the colony, okay? So queen events can be a real issue with colonies. When colonies are unprotected, other bees come in and rob them. Robbing is a phenomenon of the fall, but we need to recognize a colony that has had honey that has then had the honey robbed. 
And the difference that you see is instead of capped honey cells, you see this very ragged, ragged appearance to where the honey had been, okay? Um, and it can be on all of the frames or just on some of the frames. Um, and this will then have bits and pieces that fall into the cells. And so don't confuse bits and pieces of wax or bits and pieces of dry sugar in cells with that, that mite guano, okay? The mite guano is, is pasted to the side of the cell. This stuff is just sitting sort of on the edge of the lower level of the cell before you tip the frame and, and everything goes all over the place, okay? So this would be an example of robbing, and we'll see this at any time of the year, but particularly it's an issue in the fall. And uh, on a bottom board, and if you use sticky boards, it's a great measuring for it because all of a sudden your your sticky board, your debris, what we call a debris, debris board, sticky board, if you use those, you have a bottom board that can incorporate those, you bought that bottom board, a great indication of robbing all of a sudden occurs. Okay? Questions on any of this? So this is kind of a a, a rewrap of the of the what I talked about with dead out. The one uh, slide you had with the queen cells on the face, and it had all that spotty brood pattern there. Is that because they lost the queen for replacing it, so you have a little bit of spotty brood pattern in it? Uh, so my question is, so is that spotty brood pattern because they they're losing the queen? They've lost the queen. Um, there's two factors, yes. The queen, for whatever reason, what, um, was not <clears throat> solid in her egg-laying pattern, so this, the pattern became spotty. But the second could be, now, at all, at any one time, there are a few worker bees that are laying eggs. The nurse bees police that and get rid of them, okay? Well, without that queen, the pheromones of the queen, that policing becomes less rigorous, and so now the drone cells start appearing, these tap cells, because those are the, the effects of workers laying eggs. So a bit of both, yeah. Other questions or comments on? Okay, so spring diseases, we have, a, we have several of the spring diseases uh, that just appear. Um, when, as soon as we finish, we'll go look at one of them, the fungus, chalk brood. Um, uh, the second will be uh, 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 sack brood, and the larva looks like a sack and comes out. Again, the, 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 this could be one of your more, more valuable uh, tools, so that we have a colony in the spring that has a bit of a spotty pattern, not terribly, terribly, terribly spotty, because in the spring, patterns can just kind of look, look spotty, okay? Um, this is a frame from a freezer. So you can see it's not a, not a great spring frame. Um, but again, they can, you know, the number that normally uh, when she lays eggs, something in the vicinity of 92 to 95 percent yield an adult bee. I mean, incredible that, the, the, you know, the get to an adult that level of percentage. They're very, very efficient. Ants, the same type of thing happens. But in the spring and the fall, that percentage drops simply because of, of not enough nurse bees to care for, things don't get fed. Some things don't happen as well in the spring and the fall. So we have a colony then with, that we pull up and we look at the brood pattern in the spring and we see this pattern. So we're gonna take and see, does, does the, does the uh, larva come out? So we wanna look in our emphasis at these cells here, these cells that seem to have a perforation. Cells that seem to have a hole in the middle or instead of being a little slightly dome shaped are sunken, okay? Um, so with a spotty pattern, you're gonna find this. You're gonna find some of these. So are we gonna be looking at uh, uh, something that is sac brood? Are we gonna be looking at uh, 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 one of the bacterial diseases, what we call the foul broods? There's European fowl brood and American. So I'm going to take a look at a cell that's sunken, and rather than one really at the outside, I'm going to go more towards the middle because this one should have been cared for. So here's a cell that's got a tiny perforation in it. I'm going to kind of scrape the, 
the capping away. Using the toothpick, I'm going to go in and see if the remains come out. And again, although from the freezer they break up a bit, notice that the remains do come out, okay? So the remains came out, so that's a, that's a good sign uh, because we can get them out. And now instead of gray, this is not white like it should be. It's off color, but it's not gray. It has more of a yellowish, a lighter color sheen to it, okay? Um, and, and, the, and the importance of that is that, that this, could, this larva that, that should have been the prepupa came out <coughs> because it died. It didn't get to that stage. Um, and it has this off color and uh, but it came out and so this is a characteristic that we call European fowl brood when we see live living material this is from the freezer we see live living material we will see um, cells that were never capped but have something in them and it's it's they're lying down and they're not the the bright white uh, uh, C shape sitting in the bottom of the cell. And, and we call that a twisted uh, larva that's twisted. And so at the end of the toothpicks, I'm going to indicate two of those particular cells um, where the larva is just not at the shape that it should be. It's more twisted like a corkscrew in the cell. And you can see it's not grayish, but it also is off color, and it's a little bit of a yellowish color. So we can go ahead and pass that around. Now this is an active colony. They don't have much capped honey up in the upper corners of that cell because they have to dilute the honey. So they've, they've, they've broken into their honey, capped honey cells, and they're diluting it with, uh, with water to, to be able to eat the honey. So that's the bacterial disease, European fowl brood. And you can see it in most colonies in the spring. So the answer, so the question is, how prevalent is it as a colony? Lots of cells or just really on one frame? Um, and that will help dictate what you might do. There's a couple of things we can do for European fowl brood, but the major thing most of us can do is put some more feed on the colony help the colony to heal itself, get those as many of those worker bees to live as possible. So a feed on the colony will, will help, uh, usually will try to help uh, the colony. You can also use an antibiotic. It's called, uh, there are two of them that are available, but you must now to be able to purchase the antibiotic because the uh, Federal uh, Drug and, uh, Administration of, of, of the Feds, of the US, of the U.S. government, FDA, has considered that the, our animals that we consume have a heavy level of different antibiotics. So as a matter of trying to control how much we might be exposed to, they're controlling the ability of any, any husband uh, any husband animal um, to be able to purchase on an open market the antibiotics. You cannot. You have to get it through a veterinarian prescription. We usually feed it at, to, the, the, to the bees as a, as a feed. So it's put into a protein feed and fed to our bees. Um, and so what, we ha what, what you're looking for is a, 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 a feed directive permission to be able to, to apply that feed that has the antibiotic in it. Right? A pro other problem we have is that the drug we have used, teramycin, which is all the myosins that you know, you're treating yourself and your, your you know, youngsters, grandkids with the myosins all the time, um, it, that we have that level of exposure. And um, the, the pathogen itself has developed resistance. In other words, the bacteria and bees has developed resistance, so it's not very effective. The nice thing with teramycin is you feed it and it disappears. It does its job as an antibiotic and it disappears very quickly in the animal. 
Uh, the replacement is a material called Pylosin, and it does not disappear. It does a great job of suppressing the development of the drug. So for, for a pathogen to survive, we talk about a triangle. You've got to have a susceptible host, you've got to have the pathogen, and you've got to have the environment. When you feed an, an antibiotic to the system, to the animal, for example, it's cutting off the environment. The pathogen is still there, the susceptible host is still there, the honeybee, uh, the, the pathogen is the bacteria, but you're cutting off the expression because you're cutting off a favorable environment to, for the pathogen to grow. So that's what antibiotics do in the system. And when you have an antibiotic that stays in the system for much longer, then what you do is you still have pathogen, you still have host, but you're not seeing it, okay? It's not being expressed, so you can't find it in a colony. Well, that's good because we can't find it and the colony is doing better. However, that drug then stays in the system longer, and if it's an animal we're consuming, that, that, that antibiotic may come through in the foods that we're consuming. So that, that's the concern. They, the the uh, pathogen is not yet resistant to the bacteria. So in resistance, you have bacteria, the pathogen, the host, but now the pathogen has other strains where it's not being killed by the antibiotic. So you're still affecting the environment, but not to the same degree because now you've got a host, um, a pathogen that's resistant. Okay? So all three parts of the triangle have to work to make this, to, for, for you to have a disease, for animals to have a disease, plants, the same thing, okay? okay? So questions on European problem. Did you say it's most often seen in the spring? Most often seen in the spring. It can be seen any time of the year. We believe the pathogen is present in most colonies. Now, after a bee emerges from a cell, the bees, the worker bees, the cleaning bees, actually put sort of a veneer on that cell so it's clean for the queen to come back and lay an egg. That's where the pathogen is, tied up in that veneer. Um, so it's there. If you've had it in a colony, it then could be expressed again under stress conditions, and that most uh, most likely occurs in the spring. So that's why it's a spring or stress disease. Yeah. If you did discover this and you had just a small amount, and so you were going to feed them to help them resist themselves, what would you feed them now? Uh, sugar water. Just the straight sugar. Water. Yeah. Okay. Now you could also consider the protein. So so protein feeds work best when the bees are able to get some protein. So the last couple days they got out and got a lot of protein. In other words, pollen. So feeding now would make a lot of sense right now this week because they're not getting out today or with the temperatures, maybe not much this week. And so what you're supplementing what's out there naturally, that's when they best take these, these extra feeds. Now, I always caution on feeding in the spring is that be careful of what you wish for because you're supplementing what is there naturally you're creating an artificial growth condition. You are, you are putting stuff right in the colony. You're going to grow colonies, okay? Ab perhaps abnormally large colonies for the conditions that, that uh, your colony you're not feeding. And so then that leads to the process of swarming. I have one more question. If you were to do a split on a really large colony, would you take the European Likely. So if you do the split, if the, your parent colony has it, you're transferring frames to another unit, likely you're taking that inoculum, the bacteria. Yes. Okay. Yes. To do a protein feed, is there a good local source for getting pollen? Local source for pollen, no. For the, for the supplemental pollen, so we go to... Uh, to any of the web so uh, so yeah. sources. And there are, there are possibilities. There are about seven different possibilities. Um, the data indicates there are a couple that seem to do better than others, but there isn't a great difference. So whatever protein that you can, you can get will work, okay? Um, what is the, Troy, do you have a favorite pollen uh, sub? Yeah. I use the Global Patties. Global Patties. It has a 4% pollen in it. 
but Man Lakes has come out with a new one that has 5% pollen in it. I don't know. So, so, so these are formed material. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't know. Oh, I, I, I bought both the Man Lakes and the Global. The bees seem to prefer the Global over the Man Lake version. I don't know why, but. Um, and Hilco sells it for $129 for a 40 pound box. That's shit. And Man Lake is about $119, but you gotta pay the shipping. I think they have to, you have to have $150 worth of they have free shipping if you have a certain level of, of order. Yeah. 119, that's not very much, but it, you know, a couple boxes and you're up there already. So. Go together with a friend to get the free shipping. Yeah. Um, at least one of our associations is selling um, some of the materials. Um, uh, the Portland Metro Group is selling the, uh, the, the protein tablets. Well, they're not on the store, but they will be on. Yes, I'm sorry. I was going to mention, I, I contacted Carolyn Grease about vets in the local area to get these DFE things, and I contacted one of the vets, and they wanted $600. They want to come out to your apiary, inspect the colony, and that's before they even write the prescription. Wow. I thought it was kind of steep. And, and do these vets, do these vets, uh, are they special vets? Are they trained? Do they know what they're looking for? There are trained vets willing to do the bees. But uh, Carolyn Priest has a list. I think there were like three or four vets on there. Uh, only one was in the Portland area. Uh, veterinarians' uh, code of ethics indicates that they must must see, must verify that you have the disease. So. You're a knowledgeable beekeeper, and you call the vet and say, "I have, you know, I know I have." <coughs> Their code of ethics would say that they also have to look at it. They can't just take your word for it. Now, if you have a relationship, you have other animals. You have a relationship with a veterinarian. They may indeed uh, prescribe things without actually coming out and looking at your horse or your or your bee. That's the situation I have. I started started with my vet that takes care of my dogs brought the bees in there. She was interested. I trained a whole bunch of veterinarians up in Olympia, so I have no problem getting it. Okay. Do they charge? They don't charge me. <laughs> <laughs> they may still charge to write the prescription, but not yeah. not the time and effort. I mean, $600 to come out and visit and confirm. They've had all this training to get up to that, that speed, and it's not a, not a heavy business for them, so that's why the price is up. So. Time. Time. Yep. Okay, um, the second of our, our bacterial diseases is American Fowl Brood, and I have two frames of American Fowl Brood, and our apiary manager here, well, Jenna and Steve and Tim, at this point get very nervous because I have <laughs> American Fowl Brood um, here on the table. So I have, uh, I have actually two frames of American fowl brood. And again, we start with the fact that we have a very spotty brood pattern. Okay, spotty brood pattern. Um, and like, like uh, European fowl brood, to try to catch uh, the fowl brood, the bacterial diseases early is, is what we're the first line of defense. Okay, so trying to catch these early. Now on this one, you can see there's a bunch of mold here and that is because the, the bee cluster was at, over the brood at the time when the colony died, all right? So, so when you look at it, this, would, might, this might be covered with lots of bees, um, the, the remains of a, of, a, of a cluster, and you then determine, you know, what, what might be the reason that they died. Now, this one has a great number of sunken cells and perforated cells, more than the other frame that went around. And that's part of the key that we're looking for. With European fowl brood and sac brood um, and uh, the, the, the spring diseases that we find, we're looking at open brood, mainly the larva. With American fowl brood, we want to look at the cap stage. So that's what we have here, cap stage. And we're looking at those cells that are blackened that are darkened, that have perforations, okay? 
Remember, I, I picked out a perforated cell before and I tried to pull the, and I was able to pull the larva off and it had sort of a yellowish sheen to it. Now we're looking at cells that are really sunken and really darkened, all right? Uh, and also then have the perforation. And again, uh, the number of cells that we have. So we're gonna do the, that toothpaste, toothpick test, um, toothpaste. And we're gonna go in and then do the same thing with one of those that was sunken, more in the middle, and try to pull out something that comes out. And now we're gonna see if as it comes out, it comes out in a, in a, in a fashion that is roping out. It's gonna be darker color. And it's gonna rope out from the cell. Now, this one is not roping really well. You, I've, I've got the, the uh, it is a pre-pupa, almost ready to be a pupa that I looked at. Let me pull out another one. Not everyone will show that characteristic. Um, there is, is, odor? There is, there's going to be an odor, but you see now, one of those cells, there's nothing in there to pull out. I'm not able to find anything that's in the cell to pull out. And, and you'll find that in a number of cells. There, there should have been something in there, but nothing is pulling out, okay? And, and if we look at the lower portion of the cell itself, we find that it has dried down to what we call a scale, and the scale is tightly adhering. So nothing is coming out from the cells because it's dehydrated and it's formed that scale, and the scale is tightly adhering to the lower cell margin. Um, the, um, the cells that have a scale, again, I'll put a toothpick in this. Now, don't go home right away without washing your hands as, as this, this frame go, goes around. The disease um, it will spread, but it, it's actually fairly difficult to, to infect a colony with the disease. So we want to look and see if we can see the scale. We see spider webs that are in the cells, um, you know, an indication of, of, of issues that, of neglect by the bees, now, of course, in storage as well. So I'm going to put this on cells that have an obvious scale. This is one of them that I opened up. Okay, so these two tooth picks so, that are together, that's American Pow Brute. This is and my as Mike point. indicated, smell the frame. Okay, imprint. So, do we right? need to take special precautions passing this around? Uh, no, because we don't have bees out, so. Okay. We're doing okay. Inspection. Don't, don't let Tim take this frame afterward. Tim's I'm sorry, what? We're don't doing doing worry, I won't do it. You <laughs> won't. <laughs> We're, we're not going to get into a hive today. I mean, my, my plan was to, if the weather permitted, the weather's not going to permit. So. This frame has, uh, again from the neglect, this frame also has maggots in it. And you can see on this one some examples of some maggots. Um, they, they don't have a head, so, so that's the difference. So that, here you can see a lot of effect from maggots. So a lot of things start going wrong. Um, you see bees, that, uh, larvae that are in the wrong position that are curled. Uh, we don't believe the two fowl broods exist together, uh, but, but the, the larvae here um, are effect of, of not being fed and they were then wandering, trying to get out of their cell to try to find food, okay? So I'll, we'll start this one this way. I have this one to show that we see fowl brood, American fowl brood, so infrequently that I, none of us recommend that you do anything when you find this condition. But first, to get it confirmed, okay? Get someone else's, someone else's eyes on this or get a sample of this to somewhere else. So this would be an example of taking a sample of part of this comb, so cutting the comb out, taking the sample an inch by an inch, and then sending it to, um, you can send it either to the U.S. Department of Agriculture or to the Oregon State Laboratory, B Lab, and they will then um, actually pull the scales out and look for the pathogen itself. So they're not looking just on the field test that we're using to try to see what this is. Okay, so this would be an example of, of what you might send. 
Now, do not send it tightly uh, uh, boxed up or, or jarred up because we don't want mold to grow in this, which will happen pretty quickly. So we, we say to send it in paper uh, open so that we don't get mold growing in this so that we can actually see something in the, in the sample. So I'll go ahead with this. So this is the second one. You can see there's less evidence of the brood disease here, but you can still see some of the characteristics. Um, how that looks like. Oh, here. So here's here's our. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so here's the uh, the sheet that looks at the same thing. Sunken. So this would be a more active case when there still are bees on there, and then this is the insert showing that scale. In this case, the scales are not completely dehydrated. They are lightly colored. So you take your toothpick here and try to pull these out, and again, they don't come out, okay, from the, from the scale part. So the insert shows the scale. The other shows these sunken cells um, looking ragged, ragged-looking cells that are capped. So the American fall brood cap. The state coming out would be the, before it dehydrates completely? Yeah, and and the roping, this this ropiness is at, before it completely dehydrates. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, one more question. On this American foul food frame that's going around, there's gray spots on it. Is that mold that's moved in later? That's I think a freezer bird. I think oh, that's okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's I the best we can do, unfortunately, and it's never a great <laughs> representation. I have a question. Yes. So, does freezing the frame, does that, uh, does it, is it no longer ropey after it's frozen? So, so freezing it, the things kind of dehydrate, and you lose the ropiness test as a good definitive test. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, but if, it still, if it still hasn't completely dehydrated, you ought to still be able to see some ropiness. There is a fantastic video that Carolyn Brees at the Oregon State University has done. I've shared it with the people that are doing the, the, um, the dead out disease work. These are people that are volunteering in your associations to actually come and look when you have a situation that you think you know or may know what it is as a teaching or a learning situation. We want you to be the first. Um, we're going to ask you for a little bit of information, a photo if you can send it. If it's something obvious, we might be able to save uh, people's time and, and effort to come visit you. But if it's one of these situations where perhaps it could be European, perhaps it's a dead out that just doesn't fit all the characteristics. Um, a member of the association can, uh, as a quote task force, uh, in other words volunteers, can come perhaps and visit you or you can bring the frame to them at a meeting perhaps or in some other situation. Uh, Paul has already been doing that extensively with the Olympia group up in uh, Washington. We've had our task forces and this is just uh, reinforcing that training. It's going to rain, isn't it? <laughs> Let's, let's uh, go look at a disease situation. The last thing I wanted to do today was actually go in and show how to look for disease. And it starts with the end frame and then works in. We're obviously not going to do this today, but one of the diseases that we can do just by looking at the entrance is chalk brood. So um, as, as sometime during the day, if you want to go um, to the edge of the the uh, hexagon building. That's the one with the open door. The, the very it's a purple and blue one, I think. Tim, right? It's the very first colony. You will see the mummies of chalk brood on the landing board. And then, if you want to walk all the way around the ap uh, apiary, you may be able to see another colony that has mummies out front. Right? The other thing I wanted to show, and, and, if, and some people are not here, that particular first colony, the bees have chewed the XPS bulb, and they've created entries by Ooh. chewing the XPS bulb as a way to get in the colony. Incredible. I haven't seen that yet. That is 
Anyone else with a phone seen that? Uh, nope. No. Not the, the styrofoam. Just, yeah, the not the box. Yeah. yeah, not the, not the styrofoam <laughs> boxes. Those that's a different type of uh, styrofoam than the XDS one. Yeah. It's not no. No. That's a way to get into the top of the colony. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Other questions that you might have? Yes. So if you do discover chalk fruit, what do you do? So, chalk brood is, is um, a colony that is susceptible, and what we would then do is mark that colony, and sometime later in the year, not during the spring when, the, when you're seeing it, to try to replace the queen. So get a queen from another source, from, from what that one might be, and replace the queen. The inoculum is there, the spores, are, the, the chalk brood is still there, and it may take a couple of seasons to work through so you can get it replaced. Um, we've got some uh, hand sanitizer if you want to use the hand sanitizer. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to Okay. Is it green curry and then the No, it's, so she has the genetics that, that mean that the, that the disease can be, is more expressed. Yeah. We do not have a fungicide as such to put into the colony, so we just try to change stock. Immediately when you see it now in the spring, this colony is losing bees that should become adults. So again, feeding, trying to get them stronger, faster, is about the only technique we have. And also the protein and particularly the sugar. It works often or sometimes? For, we very seldom, you can never say never with bees. Have a colony die from European fowl brood or die from chalk brood um, uh, or die from, uh, you know, any of these diseases other than American fowl brood. So this was a killer. So the colony is in a downward spiral, all right? Just as high mite numbers showing with the spottiness is a downward spiral. It may or may not survive winter. It may survive winter in a very weak stage, and so it struggles yet another season. So, so sometimes these, these diseases will carry over one season to the next. One thing I noticed about European cowbird, <coughs> by studies in that, and when I pollinate blueberries, the bees are most susceptible to European cowbird. What you say from blueberries? Paul's point is, is when that he uses his bees to pollinate blueberries, they seem to be more susceptible. Same thing happens in cranberries, and those are two na northern North American plants, native plants. There seems to be this relationship, um, and and there are multiple studies now go ongoing and have been over the years, and we see the relationship, but we can't figure out what it is. Is it is it a lack of, of protein? Is it the protein content itself? It turns out with both bees on blueberry and cranberry, they're really not collecting the pollen from those plants, um, which is, would, would suggest that there is some level of protein deficiency in a colony, but maybe not because the protein is coming from the blueberry. Confusing, right? It's totally confusing. We don't know the relationship, but, but what Paul has indicated, that relationship seems to occur. So if you're near blueberries, I'm, I'm not talking of a few plants in your backyard or where you might have your bees. We're talking about, about you know, a large concentration and, and, and often bees move there for purposes of pollination. But again, it's, it's a spring relationship and, and bees in there are placed in these areas where there's a large amount of blue, uh, blueberry just somehow is, is doubling down or making it more likely that the county will get blueberry, or will, will get um, uh, European fowl brood. But they go away. So, so this month, you'll find European fowl brood in a number of counties. In May, you may find it in a, a few counties. By June, you don't find it. Where'd it go? Okay. But then again, next year, often, it'll come back in those same counties. Another good reason for very dark combs to go ahead and try to uh, to, to recycle. With American fowl brood, the only significant effective treatment 
is to eliminate the frames. You're eliminating the, the brood. The adults carry it as well, and it can be in the honey. So our treatment is to get rid of the frames of a colony that may have it. So that's pretty significant. You put a lot of money and effort into those, and that's why I say the first thing you need to do is get it confirmed, all right? And again, someone in your club that knows how to do it, any members of any, any of these people of our task forces in the three clubs here in Portland area, um, or sending a sample to a lab to get it confirmed. Now there is, a, in addition, a home test kit that looks very much like the, uh, the home pregnancy, the home, the COVID test. Um, you can use one of those. You would take and, and, and make a slurry of that yet to be completely dehydrated suspect. You could do it in two or three cells. You put it in a well, and then it's a, it's a reactive agent. You get a line to indicate that the test is still effective. If you get the second line, then that indicates that you have that particular pathogen. There is false positives and false negatives. We think it's somewhere in the 90 percentage range of being accurate, which is about what the pregnancy level is, the COVID level perhaps a little bit higher. Those are about 15 bucks. Um, the clubs do have them, and, and uh, members of the club, and um, if you would reimburse for that initial expense of $15, you can then get one without, without uh, going through man lake and paying the shipping. So if you have a swarm, and so you have to restart your thinking of what they might be bringing to your life, a whole new group of bees, they could have anything, so you just have to wait and see. Watch Colony you buy, a nuke, um, a package, a Doors. swarm you get for free, a transfer from a cutout. Everybody. They could be bringing something, yes. Now, we generally say, because, because the packages and nukes come from an established beekeeper, they have been treating their colonies, we generally say um, they are free of, of anything that you may find. All right. The swarms, because that colony was strong enough to swarm, we generally say generally those are those are free of materials. Yes. Now, mites is a whole different story because mites will be in any of those sources. Um, again, a swarm can be treated with uh, with uh, with things that that your colony can't be treated with. The package the same way. So, I'm talking about being able to use oxalic acid for broodless colonies, package or the swarm. Not for the nuke because you're buying an established baby colony, a nucleus of a colony. So the oxalic acid doesn't work as well. Okay, here's Paul showing uh, the uh, honeybee fowl brood test. This is the AFB. It does have an expiration date. So this is, uh, this is what the, it looks like. And again, you can order it directly. But I'm saying that the very same thing, um, because we don't see enough of it, where none of us are experts, okay? And so our idea of the task force is they're gonna have a chance to see some of this. You see it, um, and then it's much easier to try to see it. Will the COVID test work on that too? I'm sorry? Will the COVID test work on that too? <laughs> Hopefully the COVID <laughs> test does not work on that. I think your bees are probably gonna test yeah. for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> the other like issue is, is I asked you to smell the, the, the American fowl brood frame. And um, so these are the two American fowl brood frames here, yes. So so try to imprint that smell and and it's a it's a, a very unique and distinct smell, so that might help as well. Hey, dude, I got a question. Yeah. While you're waiting for yeah. test results, what precautions should you take? Uh, so, <laughs> again, it's not. We talk about it and the danger of it spreading. So until you get the confirmation, um, don't do anything special with the colony. Leave it as it is. Um, I would reduce the entrance so that the guards can, even though there might be a lot of foragers coming and going, still reduce the entrance so the guards can better protect against drifting bees. So when drifters come in, um, they, they stay. 
Uh, when robbers come in, they're going more towards the honey, so that they're not necessarily going to where the dis active disease is, is ongoing. So yes, there is a chance it will transfer uh, to other colonies, but but it's negligible because of the, those behaviors. And if it's a dead out and you don't have any guard bees? So, the, the serious issue is if this is a dead out and then bees come in and we get this robbing, etc. That is, that is a serious issue. So, the way that you would look on a dead out is see if you see that scale. Uh, where I had the two sets, everyone see that extra scale. We don't see that in any of the other so here are the, uh, this was the uh, European f uh, frame. Here was, no, this was, you know, th these are, these are, uh, uh, these are the uh, mite killed colonies, um, dead outs in the spring. This was the European colony, the European disease, and then these two the Americans. So we have a chance, another chance to look at them. And I thank Paul for bringing these slides. These are these are a little bit pricey, uh, but um, it might be very effective that that, that a club buy these for for uh, and put them in and we would put them in actually in frames. Yeah. I think they're forty cheaper, bucks. Cheaper, cheaper than the price of a car. Yeah, so it's, it's cheap and cool. Is this is this what you get for the yeah. Yeah. University of Guelph? Yeah. University of Guelph. You can go online to their website and they have a store. But when you order them from the store, you do not order them online. Tell them you're going to pick them up there. You then have to calculate the, the shipping cost for you. Okay. Because they're from Canada. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, uh, also, the University of Guelph has a, also has a, a YouTube video um, on looking for disease. So Paul Kelly, who's that technician that, that developed all these, um, has that has a video also in terms of looking looking for the disease. Our OSU website has a website for how do you submit a sample uh, of of a disease, or if you're concerned with the number of mites in your colony, how do you submit a sample so that they will look for the number of mites, and they will do this, and there is no charge from the, from OSU. Okay. They'll tell you how to ship them, uh, you know, that, that information. But particularly if you have not looked, look on the website. We will post that on the pub site. <laughs> I posted it to the other people. We ought to post the, those, how to find those videos. Okay. Okay. I have a question. question. Yes, Do we, so if you're in your hive and you think you have AFB and you're doing your test, you're waiting, and you used your gloves, you used your equipment, what do you wash them in to clean those off? Just, is it bleach or? So the tools that you used in, and you think then you've got American yeah. Fowl Brood is, is either with uh, burning the material, in other words, uh, put, uh, put them in a, as you're, you're cleaning up your smoker, you know, fire it up so you actually have flames coming out and put them in there. But be careful because it's going to be hot. You don't want to handle it. Or, or the bleach solution. Scrape all the propolis that you have off first. Get rid of all of that, and then the bleach solution. Don't try to prop uh, use the bleach over the propolis, uh, and propolis of wax that you have. There. Okay. Does alcohol kill it? Uh, alcohol will work as well. Um, uh, and even you know, even rubbing alcohol will will work. But again. The major thing is to scrape first, get rid of all that first before you do that. So what if you have gloves? I mean, and for I that reason, so <laughs> yeah, for that reason, it is better to have, uh, if you, if you, if you suspect it right away, take off your, your heavy V gloves and put on the disposable gloves uh, and then you can get rid of the gloves after that. Do the bees show any uh, aggressive action? Or are they are they different? Is their nature different with with the if they have foul brood in them? Or can you are you going to get stung more? Or are you not going to get stung more? Are they going to be more lethargic? They, you know they're going to be sick, right? They're going to be sick, and and the colony will will kind of have a different feel and a different sound. But that's 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 after a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can you can. 
tell something is not going on as it should be. And it comes from sound and number of bees that are there, etc. Not necessarily the aggressiveness, it just they are they have, and with mites too, they have sort of that vacant look, but no one, you can't really describe it, it just comes a little bit from experience. And I hope all of you will get up to that level of experience. Not that you're going to find a disease, but you'll have that chance to be able to. Uh, Dewey, yes. I, I read on one of the websites, I don't all the links that you put out, that the foul brood can be killed in the vegetative state with bleach, but it doesn't kill the spores, and the only thing that would do that was gamma rays or yeah. heat. Is that wrong or? No. So, so, um, so the spores are here. Each spore has, so the spore is a way that the bacteria can live at a time when it doesn't have living material to live in. So it's obligate to living material. So as these dehydrate, there's less material that's available. And so they go into this spore stage and, and one of these spores has millions of the bacteria. So it's all encapsulated. Nothing really kills that. And so that's why we would go ahead and destroy, not attempt to use, reuse this comb, um, uh, uh, at all, and the adult bees will be carrying it on their bodies, and the honey they have stored, there's a possibility of it getting into the honey. So that's why we want to get rid of all of the frames. Now the boxes that, are, that they are in, in many cases, we will scrape them very well, get it rid of as much propolis and wax as you can, and then clean the inside with a torch, so, uh, something that's going to, um, not a power wash, but a torch, that will then, so any of your wooden boxes, um, covers and bottom boards, um, tools that you've used, for example, um, try to, to go ahead and, and clean them very well and then um, torch so that you burn anything that's still left that's there. So no, the, the spores are, are there. The bee comes along, uh, the queen comes along, puts an egg in there. The egg then develops into the larva in three days. Now you have living material, and somehow those encapsulated spores then are able to sense that, and so the spore coats are broken, and then that larva is infected. And it continues to cycle. So it's a downward spiral. spiral. Um, hopefully we can catch it before we lose the entire colony, because once the entire colony is lost, then that colony is, is susceptible to the robbing and the robbers then can bring that material back to their town. Robbing screens. robbing screens are a good way. Robbing screens are a way to reduce an entrance so the bees going out are different from the other bees. We have a lady that comes and feeds the cats. I think cat lady, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Over on the, on, the, on the park side of the fence. Yeah. Yeah. I, how, how long will the foul brood live on the surface without any treatment? Forever. In the spore stage, yeah, they've, they've collected the spores and put them in a jar, and every 10 years or so they pick them out, and so last time, 80 years, they were still alive. That once, that once you gave them live material. Last fall, I lost a couple of hives, and there were a lot of dark combs in there, practically all of them. And I went to clean them out, and there are a lot of that dried cups on the bottoms of the frame. Plastic frames. Now, what I did is I, I we looked on YouTube, and there was a thing where you soak them in bleach water and Dawn soap for a couple of weeks, and then pressure wash them, and a lot all those caps popped right out. And then I then I burned them all with a torch, and then I rewax them. And should I use those? Uh, it would be suspect. Would be suspect. Is there anything else that will cause those dried things in the bottom? Well, yes. Uh, any of the other diseases are just simply a colony that dies over winter. Those are going to dry down into a dehydrated scale. Yeah. And, and normally, again, if if the scales come out, you you you're thinking that it's not American fowl blue. If the scales don't come out, they're still there. They're still adhering after all of that and you actually look at cells and you see in the an extra rim on the bottom of the cells 
then certainly not try to reuse that. You know. You're showing the light in there, I'm showing the black light in there, and you can see a, like a white sheen in the very bottom, subtle like in the cup. Is that is that was that it? No, um, that those were so so some of these larvae were still healthy, and so there are dead larvae in here at the time we put it in the freezer. Yeah, it wasn't any larvae where we were looking at. Okay. And, and that's, that's why we thought, well, that's what they're talking about. Because you can see no, white no. Thing. So we're talking with a scale of this thing being adhering to the lower to the of this the lower two sides of this six-sided cell. Yeah. We'll have to point it out to yeah. you. When he says lower, it's actually on the side, right, not on the bottom. Oh. I think what he was seeing sure. was the so yellow I, of the... I, of the foundation. Of the foundation. The yeah, there. This is a plastic, so we might, looking at some of the cells, you'll see see that maybe see the plastic. You'll also see some encapsulated or um, 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 what do we call them? Um, uh, cells that have pollen in them that have an extra capping, a very dark capping over, not a capping, but a, a covering. Um, so these are cells that. For whatever reason, the bees uh, covered them so that they don't go into those cells and try to use the protein that's in there. Propolis? No. Uh, well, it is a it's a it's a propolis mixture, propolis okay. and wax mixture. Yeah. Um, these are cells that, for whatever reason, they feel are contaminated with pesticide. Okay. So you also see so so I mean there's a lot going on in this on the frames with American fowl brood. And the freezer gives you a slightly different effect, of course. Um, the the video that Carolyn has produced was a colony that was had just died, and and shows all the ropiness, shows the uh, the scale very well, um, and and the fact that some of the cells are alive, some are not, shows the real distinction between sunken capping versus a normal capping. So and make you sure you look at that. There? I'm sorry. That's the one. Uh, uh, Oregon State University. Or yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll post that uh, the the YouTube uh, um, address on the on the um, website. So what I'll, I'll try to do is I will get it on the resource page on the pub website, and then I'll just send a link out to my apiary list. If you signed up for the emails from the apiary, I'll send it out to that group too. Um, so. we, it's not raining very high. Let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, looking at this chalk brood.